who has an eye for stamps? An eye that sees stamps not just as pictures to post, but as tiny windows giving another dimension to the world. Catch that image, snatch that reflection, for stamps are designed to reveal the many facets of a nation. There might be something in the front of this book. Um, I will have... Were you looking for the downy head? Yes, have you got the downy head? Yes. But who are the stamp collectors? <laughs> This is Alan de Cadenet, racing driver and stamp collector par excellence. I actually get perhaps more excited collecting stamps than I do racing cars. That may sound funny, but discovering something new in postage stamps really does make me feel great, whereas I've got to keep very calm in a racing car and I'm just not allowed to get excited. That's perhaps why I collect the stamps of King George V, because there's so many of them, and the variety is so great that I can I can go on for years just looking for new things and then writing about them. King George himself actually was quite an extraordinary monarch because he instigated the idea of walkabouts, of going out to meet his people. He took such an interest, in fact, in his job as monarch that he was involved in the design of his own stamp. Uh, he knew the engraver, he knew the designer, and he told the Royal Mint exactly what he wanted and what he didn't want. In fact, uh, he and Queen Mary chose together a royal court portrait. This is the original 1910 Downey court portrait head that was used, in fact, for the first two stamps, the Downey head halfpenny and the penny. The King didn't like that portrait particularly and changed to the coinage head now, this portrait was taken from the Coins of the Realm, designed by Bertram McKennell, and was subsequently used in nearly all of the stamps that were issued during the reign of King George V. Well, we are, in fact, uh, as a nation, the envy of the rest of the world as producers of stamps. The effort and uh, energy that goes into each stamp production today is far greater than any other country. And, of course, one can claim that a lot of this was instigated by King George because he took so much interest that the actual guidelines laid down in his reign are still with us today. Uh, let's take, for instance, his high-value stamps, which we call the seahorses. You will not find a better design of postage stamp ever issued. Uh, the colours, the designs are quite fantastic. George V ruled the British Empire from 1910 to 1936. He was a devoted philatelist and a man of the sea. In fact, he was called the Sailor King. How right then for Britain to turn again and again to the tradition started by this beautiful 1913 stamp and reflect its maritime heritage in issues that commemorate men like Sir Francis Drake, El Drake, or sometimes the Dragon, who routed the hostile Spanish Armada for his queen, Elizabeth I. Sir Walter Raleigh, Elizabethan adventurer, voyager, courtier, and poet. Give me my scallop shell of quiet, my staff of faith to walk upon, my scrip of joy, immortal diet, my bottle of salvation. Any island race knows that the seas can be cruel and destructive. I wish to show what such a scene was like said Turner when he painted this canvas. I got the sailors to lash me to the mast to observe it. I was lashed there for four hours. Such a scene is only too familiar to the men whose lives for centuries have been ruled by the seas and the wealth that lies beneath them. Ordinary men whose determination and courage against the relentless forces of the North Sea are commemorated here in miniature.
In coastal waters, gentler waves and milder winds help sailing boats and yachts on their way. Other yachts brave the ocean waters. They have circled the world, skippered by not-so-ancient mariners like Che Blythe. Probably one of the most exciting things about going around the world and sailing is the fact that you go to all different ports and you see all sorts of different things. And of course, a lot of the crew, we had 16 in total, have a number of hobbies. One of my particular little uh, hobbies, of course, is uh, stamp collecting. You have some very famous stamps. Sir Francis Chichester, of course, with his uh, gypsy moth. And going around the world, you go into these ports and it really is very, very exciting because you go along there and they produce some beautiful stamps, all different colors depicting nautical themes. The crew themselves, of course, tend to be get uh, one or two ribs at me for doing this uh, type of collection, but of course, we all have different hobbies, and for me, it's nice and relaxing to get away from the rigors of the sea. Yachting was the sport that King Charles II introduced into England in the 17th century. He loved the sea, and the sea was his ally. As a boy, he was forced to cross the water to escape from Cromwell's England and to spend a sad youth in exile. Nine years later, he returned home triumphantly to become king as his father and grandfather had been before him. It was said of Charles II that he understood navigation well, but above all, he knew the architecture of ships. As monarchs of an island kingdom, many British rulers have been interested in the architecture of ships. This is perhaps one of the finest examples of 16th century ship architecture, the Mary Rose, the pride and joy of Henry VIII's navy. She was launched in 1510 and 30 years later, the Mary Rose sailed past South Sea Castle with the British fleet to engage the invading French. Then, watched by her king, the wooden flagship foundered in the Solent waters and sank. Now, some 450 years on, another Royal Charles charts naval history, this time diving into the past. Charles, Prince of Wales, and great-grandson of the Sailor King, George V. It seems such a particularly interesting and uh, exciting project. Um, I do rather enjoy diving anyway, but not actually in the Solent. It's like swimming around in a kind of lentil soup. The, interest is intense and I have to be one of these people who's got a very strong sense of history and, and uh, that sort of thing appeals to me greatly. Bit by bit, the Mary Rose is reclaimed from the Solent seabed. The naval history of a great seagoing nation is recalled in this issue of British Maritime Heritage Stamps. Dauntless Admiral Blake, who against tremendous odds defeated three seemingly invincible Dutch admirals who had ruled the seas for so long. Blake died in 1657 on his flagship, the Triumph. His prestige eclipsed only by that of Horatio Nelson. Nelson, who also died in battle. Nearly two centuries on, 
Nelson's flagship, the Victory, towers over Portsmouth Harbour, protected against the assault of time and decay, a nation's homage to a great admiral. Acorns in the New Forest had already started to grow into ships when the Mary Rose sank in 1545. English oak for the timbers of the Triumph. And over a hundred years later, of the Victory. These famous wooden galleons were forerunners to the great ironclads of the British Navy. The Dreadnought from the First World War and the Warspite from the Second all part of Britain's great maritime heritage. Stamp collecting has something for everyone. Some people are interested in stamps as part of postal history. Um, the Penny and the Tupney Victoria came out in 1840. Others simply enjoy looking at them, intrigued by their design or their subject. Yes, it really depends on how, how well the margins are being cut out when the stamp is cut out with scissors. The magpie collections are fun for the beginner. Sorting out the countries, swapping six of one for half a dozen of another, proudly watching their albums swell with the increasing collection of stamps. This is, after all, the way many serious collectors started out. Collectors like Gwenda Shaw and her family. Freedom from hunger. The first stamps really I, I came across was when my mother gave me her stamp album. And from thence I got interested and when my pocket money allowed I went out and just bought the odd stamp. And gradually built up until, um, well I've got a reasonable collection now of various countries. And then I had the idea that it would be good to buy stamps for my children. And so as the new issues came out, I bought four sets of each in the, in the hope that when they grew up, they would become interested. And so when Susan got a bit older, I gave her some stamps and you then started to collect on your own. Yes. And uh, having had a basic collection, um, I buy the issues as they come out each, well, it's every couple of months or so, and uh, go to stamp fairs and shops and uh, buy the back issues. I collect British stamps. Well, my album uh, has pages in it that show you all the stamps that you can collect, if you can afford it. Um, it starts off with the Penny Black here, which I managed to buy. Well, in fact, it was given to me as a birthday present about four or five years ago. And then, uh, obviously, I've got quite a few pages that uh, don't have any stamps on at all. They're either too expensive or I haven't managed to find them yet. Um, this particular stamp I'm quite pleased with. That managed to buy it. It's, it's one that the price tends to vary an awful lot. One time it's uh, relatively easy to obtain and then the price will shoot up. I managed to buy it when it was reasonable. Mrs Shaw inspired her husband John to look at stamps, to supplement his own hobby, minerals. Twelve years ago I started collecting minerals and as a result of helping my wife with stamps, sorting them and helping her to get them catalogued, etc., it suddenly struck me that uh, possibly there could be a lot of stamps featuring minerals. More examples of different crystals, some of them very beautifully drawn. And the idea really is that of getting the stamps so that they correspond with the crystals that uh, I have already collected. Thematic collecting, as it's called, is very popular. Choose a subject, anything of special interest, and look for the stamps. How about the joy of chasing butterflies? Got it. Ah, that's the one that got away. 
But there are less frustrating ways of collecting such fragile beauty. All over the world, stamps celebrate the shock of brilliance that butterflies bring. But in Britain, these stamps express a different emotion, a very real concern for the disappearance of some species of butterflies from the countryside. How marvelously the designer catches the mood, using soft, muted colors to recapture a sense of beauty, perhaps by now only half remembered. Unrivaled quality in design and perfection in printing have always been the hallmark of British stamps. Britain was, after all, the originator of the world's first and some say most beautiful adhesive postage stamp, the immortal Penny Black of 1840. In only nine months, 63 million Penny Blacks were printed. Many, many have survived, but few like this. A complete mint sheet of 240 stamps, rare and priceless, a national treasure. Each single stamp is absolutely miniature perfect in design, in color, and in printing. It was true 150 years ago, 50 years ago, and it is equally true today. Stamp designs today vary a great deal. Some are abstract, strong and evocative. Others are like minute observations, emotional in their delicacy. Simple they may seem, but simple they are not. Patrick Oxenham, wildlife artist and stamp designer. Well, one of the biggest problems doing the um, wildlife stamps was working on such a small scale. Although the drawing is um, four times up on the stamp size, it's still only um, six inches by four inches. I work very accurately, and um, when the first um, essays were made, we found we had to um, strengthen parts of the drawing, particularly the whiskers. <laughs> Printers brought the essays down here, and we um, we went over them together to discuss the you know uh, differences or problems. And uh, in the end, they came up with a very good stamp. We're very pleased with it, and I think the results were fantastic. Look now at Britain's most familiar stamp, this everyday stamp. The definitive issue used in Britain since 1967 has always given pleasure. Yet who would expect to find 600 variations on this one theme? Well, Robin Tapper for one, professional poultry buyer and highly specialized stamp collector. I collect the best Mulmachian series which in my opinion is one of the best designed stamps we've yet issued. I think there are two ways in which we can look at the um, Decimal Machin stamp. First of all, there's the classic simplicity of the design, the simple head sculpted by Arnold Machin, and the value on a different coloured background. Um, and then there are, of course, the technical variations which interest me most. First of all, the number of shades of colour that you get. Uh, inevitable if there are going to be large printings, particularly of values which have uh, common uses, um, it's inevitable that you're going to get uh, odd differences in colour, and of course these are very collectible. Uh, I don't bother too, very, too much about errors. Anybody is human and can make a mistake. I try and um, concentrate on the stamps as intended for use by the post office, but of course if an error did come my way, I would make sure that I did hang on to it. But it in very 
very much a pity that um, the there has been this sort of craze almost towards going for errors when really there's such a wealth of interest in the uh, perfect stamps in, the, in their own right. Junked. The ruthless fate for the smallest imperfection. you at all? Yes, please. Uh, I'd like uh, some stamps of Lady Diana and Prince Charles. Okay. Starting to collect stamps needs little or no specialized knowledge. The beauty of the hobby is that collectors decide their own limits, spending as much or as little time and money as they want to. Yes, good morning. Have you got any Dutch or East European stamps? Sonny, what would you like to see first? I think the Dutch. Okay. Yes, if you'd like to come this way. This is basically um, sort of partially a collection. Uh, what's unusual about these is they have um, uh, an inverted watermark. What's, I don't... what's that? Yes, <laughs> a watermark uh, was um, embossed on, on the paper before the, the stamps printed uh, for security reasons. Uh... Oh yes, I see it. For some, the pleasure lies in just putting a simple collection together. Others enjoy the detective work, involving gums and inks, phosphors, perforations and postmarks. When he got it out, he said, uh, not it's not used. <laughs> yeah, you see, that's what you'd expect, to, to pay for a good used one, and that's... Yeah. I know you've, you've got used of that particular one, but uh, it may be an opportunity you'd, you'd like to take this time. Just have a look at it, what do you think? Oh, I don't, oh, I don't think so. No, it, yeah. it's the show-through, is it? It's the show-through of, of, of the cancel, I know yes. what I'm looking for. Okay, fine. Yeah. I have found one PUC for you. Uh, I think it's in excellent condition. Oh, that's a lovely stamp. Stamp. And this is where the name comes from. The Anglo-Saxon word stampen, meaning, quite simply, to stamp. In Britain, all first aid covers are specially stamped. But they, like everyday stamps on everyday envelopes, are still receipts. Receipts for prepayment from the post office for delivery of the mail. First aid covers, thematics, historical, technical, what is it about stamps that turns an ordinary person into a dedicated hunter, an inquisitive being, a stamp collector? This is probably my first real piece of daftness. It's a, a reconstructed sheet of penny red stamps, all 100 years old, all of them fairly tatty and fairly scruffy. Uh, they first came out this lot in 1858, and this is a complete sheet. You bought this for a pound, 240 stamps. And even though they're pretty horrible, I have, have at last got each one. Hunter Davis, writer, humorist, and stamp collector extraordinary. You probably, um, it was amazing to me when I first started collecting stamps to realize that the Victorian stamps had letters on. Each stamp had a different pair of letters or a different uh, couple of letters. And the idea was it was going to deter forgers, so the Victorians thought. Because you did a sheet of 240, and along the top you got A to L, then down the side you've got A to T, which makes it good fun when you're trying to reconstruct because you've got to get an AA, then an AB, then an AC and everything else. Then I have the whole family here. MD for my wife, Margaret Davis, and my son, JD, that's Jake Davis. Then there's FD and CD and HD for moi. This is a whole set of uh, Victorian stamps. Each with my initials on, each with HD. You can see this nice one from Luton. Not Luton Airport, because that obviously wasn't open then. The reconstructing the Victorian stuff, people have done that for decades, probably 100 years. Uh, it's good fun to do, but it's quite nice the fact that these days you can actually create your own collection, which is absolutely unique to you. I've got uh, the World Cup. You can go right back and look at stamps commemorating the history of the World Cup. Though there wasn't a stamp produced at the time for that first one in 1930. The first uh, thematic 
and we talk in England about thematics. In America, they talk about topical stamps, you know, collecting one topic. The first thing I did were the railway stamps, because I'm a railway fan. So I started collecting all stamps of the railways. And I've got these all over the house because my wife goes mad. Uh, she doesn't want to see them, so I put them in the lavatory and she moves them. Then I put them in the bathroom, so they're permanently on tour around the house. And we have a large family, so there's always teenagers coming in and out. So I feel I'm pushing uh, the idea of stamps as a hobby, you know, by showing it to all the people who come in. And so I started to frame them and display them. So wherever you go in this house, they can look at my stamps. I mean, wall after wall is covered with them. And I move them round to surprise people. They go in thinking these football stamps are going to be there, but they've gone and next day it's the railway stamps. I, I ha obviously, I've got lots of albums and lots of uh, cardboard boxes and shoe boxes full of stamps. But I thought, once you stash them away in an album, you know they're there, but you hardly ever see them. And nobody else sees them at all. And I'm proud of my stamps. So why not look at stamps with new eyes, venture into another dimension, and enjoy the world of the stamp collection?